Yes! In this video, I'm going to show you how to undo and redo any of your edits. And I'm also gonna show you how to use the history panel. In Photoshop, you can change the edits that you make to an image with the undo and redo commands. This video will show you how to undo, how to redo, and how to step back in time as you're editing. You can follow along with this file for this tutorial or just use an image of your own. The link for this image is in the description or you'll find it in the actual course. Now let's make some adjustments to this image. Okay, so the first thing I've done is I've opened this image, right? And I'm going to add a levels adjustment layer and adjust the contrast by dragging in the white and black point sliders. Now I'm gonna add a black and white adjustment layer. So let's say that you want to get rid of that last adjustment you just did in Photoshop. In this case, it was making the black and white adjustment layer. So to make that disappear, the quick way to do it is just to use the keyboard shortcut, Command plus Z on the Mac, or Control plus Z on Windows, which I'll do now. Then the black and white adjustment layer just goes away. Now I can bring it back by pressing Shift plus Command plus Z again, or I can use Shift Control plus Z for Windows. So these two keyboard shortcuts are a toggle for undoing and redoing the last thing you did, whatever it was. So that way you can kind of see a quick before and after to see if you really like it. Now, if you prefer to use a menu command rather than the shortcut, you can go up to the edit menu and there you can choose undo. Photoshop will even remind you what action you're about to undo or redo. Now, what if you want to undo more than just one step? Well, in that case, just keep hitting Command or Control plus Z. You can do that up to 50 times by default now in Photoshop, and each time you're stepping back one step in time. There's one more way that you can step through time in Photoshop, and that's by using the History panel. The History panel is located here. If you don't see yours, go up to Window and go down and put a check by History. I'm going to explain this panel by moving down to its bottom bar until I see a double-pointed arrow and then dragging down so we see in this panel a separate bar for each step that I just took on this image. So we see where I opened the image, where I adjusted the contrast with levels, and where I added a black and white adjustment layer. Go choose the brush tool. Now keep your eye on the history panel as I make an X stroke on my image. Notice how my thing was just recorded in the history panel also. Now the beauty of having these states in the history panel is that you can step back through them one by one like this. Imagine if you had 50 in here. Now each time you do that, everything in the image changes to the way it looked at that specific state at that point in time. Now you can also step forward or jump forward in time in the history panel like this. The two things to keep in mind about the history panel, if you do go back to a previous state, like let's go back here, and then you do something else like paint with a different color in this area, keep your eye on the history panel and you'll see that everything after that state is now gone. It's totally disappeared. It's basically rewritten history. The second thing to keep in mind is that when you close the image, whether you save it or not, your history will disappear. And the next time you open the image, the history panel will be cleared out and it'll be ready to start fresh. Now I've been using Photoshop for 20 years and between the keyboard shortcuts and the specific way I use the layers panel, which I'll cover in detail in another video, I rarely ever use the history panel. And by rarely, I pretty much mean I almost never use the history panel, but it may work good in your workflow. So I wanted to show it to you so you have an access and a knowledge to all the tools in Photoshop to make your images the way you want them to be. Either way, you're gonna have lots of flexibility to correct any mistakes and try all kinds of creative approaches as you edit your own images. So I hope that helps. Take care. Yes! So in this video, I want to show you how you can resize an image for either web or print and the best way to save and save as your files to protect your workflow. I'm going to double click this image, which you can find in the link in the description if you want to use this one, or you can download it with the course itself. This is coming in at 33.33%. I'm going to hit Command or Control Zero just to fit it in the screen so I can optimize my real estate. And no matter what size monitor you have, whether it's a small 13-inch laptop or a big 5K 27-inch monitor, you can always use Command Zero to fit it in your screen so you get to see all of the image at once. Now, I have no idea how big this file is. The way you tell is, well, first you can look down in this left document area. You can toggle this open, and there's a lot of different things you can see, but I always like to leave it at the default to know what size my image is. This is a big file, 74 megs. It means I can't email it, I can't upload it to the web, I cannot upload it to any social media sites. It needs to be downsized. Now, if I click this, it'll give me a quick idea of how big it is based on the width, the height, and the resolution. The only other place to find that is go up to the image menu and go down to image size. This is gonna open an image size dialog box that you can grab in the banner bar and just move it wherever is most convenient for you. Now, if it's too big or too small, you can hover your cursor on the outside right corner and just drag it to whatever format is best for you. 
Again, it's reminding us how large the image file is, the dimensions based on pixels. It's fitting it to the original size, which is totally perfect. Notice there's a chain link icon here. This is basically linking the width and the height to maintain the aspect ratio. If I click that chain link, see these lines disappear? This is what it looks like if I were to do that. Now watch what happens if I were to change this to 3000, which is about half the width. Do you see how it squished the image? It's because it lost its original aspect ratio. So you always have to leave this chain click to maintain the aspect ratio. So now if I were to change this to 3000 pixels, notice it maintained the original aspect ratio. Now if I want to save this for web, I need to make sure this is set to pixels. If yours wasn't, click the disclosure triangle and choose it. Most likely yours was at inches if you're in the West, but there's a lot of other measurement output options here. So if I want to upload this to a website, I know that I need it to be 800 pixels wide for this particular site. And that's going to resize my height automatically. And it's doing that because my resample box is checked and it's going to interpolate the pixel information, throwing away image data that I don't need. See, it reduced it from a 74 meg file to like a one meg file. So if I click OK, it physically resized my image. If I hit Command or Control 1, that's 100%, at least on my screen, which is a big screen. So that's why it looks pretty small. But I want to save this. If I were to go up to File and Save right now, it would overwrite my original JPEG because this is still a JPEG. I haven't changed anything else but resize it. I need to remember to always choose Save As. I'm going to open a dialog box. And what I want to go and do is click to the left of that dot JPEG. And since I know this is for web, I'm going to hit underscore and 800 PX. That's my system for letting me know that I've resized this to a certain width based dimension. Since it is for web, I am going to leave the embed color profile sRGB check because you always want sRGB for anything on the web. I'm going to click save. It's going to open up a JPEG option quality dialog box. Basically leave everything a default of maximum of 12 for now and leave all the default format options for now. Just click OK. I'm going to go back and look at this at bridge and look what it did. It added the image right beside it. And they visually look the same. If I hadn't put this underscore 800 pics, I wouldn't know which one to click on. But the great thing about Bridge is I can click on an image, like this one is selected, the original, and I can see how large the image file is. But if I click on this image, I can see, oh, this is the one I resized 800 pixels in the width because it tells me in the metadata over here. Let's go back to Photoshop. Now I want to save one for print, but I don't want to open up the original and start all over. The last thing I did was change the image size. So I can undo that last step by hitting Command or Control Z, keyboard shortcut, or I can just come up to edit and whatever the last thing I did was, it doesn't count saving as a thing, just so you know, because you never want to undo your saving. The last thing I did in Photoshop was the image size. So I can hover over here and I can see I'm back to all my original image size. So now let's go up to image, image size, and I want to make a print. So I need to choose inches. You should base all your information for printing on inches. Again, if you're in the West, let's say I want to make a four by six print. I'm just going to type six inches here. It automatically reconfigured the aspect ratio and figured out the height for me. Now, here's the thing. If I'm printing, the default resolution should be 300. I'll explain that in much more detail in later videos. But generally, anything for the web should be at 72. But if you're sending something for print and you're figuring up your image based on inches, resolution 100% matters and 300 is a great go to. Leave resample checked. I can see my image still was shrunk in size and I'm going to click OK. I'm going to go to File, Save As. Now I'm going to click to the left of the JPEG remove the 800 pixels. And again, you'll come up with your own workflow, but I'm just going to name this four by six. I don't want an sRGB profile. I'm going to leave it at its higher Adobe 1998, which is better for printing. Click Save, just click OK, back to Bridge. So now I have a small web one, I have the original, and then I have the four by six print. Now the reason I like this workflow of naming my files, what I've done, here's why. Let's say you haven't gotten used to Bridge yet and you don't use Lightroom. Let me close that. If I were to come up to File and Open, look what happened. If I hadn't have given myself some indication as which one I resized, like let's say I'd name, like notice how these are all the same file names, so we want them close together, but I'd name one A, B, and C. Unless I have a format of, well, A is always the original, B is always the web, and C is always a four by six print. If I haven't established a workflow, I wouldn't know what this was a week from now. But here I can see, because I, I can't access any metadata quickly from right here. But I can see, oh, here's the four by six one. That's the one I want. Anyway, I hope that helped. Yes. In this video, I want to show you how you can quickly straighten a horizon line in Photoshop. 
So the first thing you're going to do is come over to the tools panel on the far left, come down to the eyedropper tool group, and then click that disclosure triangle to open the group. You're gonna see the ruler tool. This tool is actually set up to actually measure things inside of an image, and you can assign the distances and measurements to get accurate measurements within a scene, but photographers use it just to straighten layers. Watch this. Notice how my cursor changed to a cursor with a ruler. I'm just going to click on the edge of the horizon, hold down my click, and just drag a line following wherever I think the horizon is, and I'm just it's just a visual thing. So visually, I think I'm pretty much on the line. I'm gonna let go and notice how that line stayed from the two points. Just go up to the tool options bar and click straighten layer. How awesome is that? It automatically straightened my layer. But what did it do? Let me command minus just to zoom it out a bit. Notice all these transparent areas it just created for me. Now I've got to fix those. Here's a quick way to fix this kind of situation. If you go over to the magic wand tool in the toolbar, it's right here, click it. And again, if you don't see it, hold down the disclosure triangle and choose it. I need to select each of the transparent areas on the four edges of the print where it basically rotated the print. Now, the first thing I need to take a quick look at is the tool options bar. If I have contiguous check, it means I'm gonna have to shift click on each individual area of transparent pixels. But if I leave contiguous unchecked, basically Photoshop is gonna find every transparent area if I just click one of them. So watch, I'll click this one and it clicked all of them. Do you see that? Now I need to zoom in. So I'm gonna click on the zoom tool. Click, 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 click. So you can see it's selected only the transparent areas, right? So for this technique to work, you need to go up to select, modify, and expand. And this is totally based on how big your image is. This is 68 meg file. So I'm gonna go five or six pixels. I'm gonna click okay. And you see how that expanded my selection? Essentially you want the selection to kind of bite into whatever it is you want to use to fill this transparent area. Now I hit command or control zero to fit in screen. And now I'm going to go up to edit down to fill. It's gonna open a fill dialog box. And what I wanna choose is the contents. Hit that drop down arrow and choose content aware. This tells Photoshop to be aware of the content around the image. Use that content to fill the transparent area. Leave the color adaptation checked. Leave all the blending mode set to its default and just click OK. And Photoshop's going to do the work for you. This is an organic image, so it's going to fix it pretty straightforward. Click Command or Control D to deselect. Or if you haven't learned your keyboard shortcuts yet, just go to select, deselect. And again, right here, it reminds you what the keyboard shortcut is. There we go. It did a great job. I don't see any weirdness anywhere around here. So you would want to save this image. And again, the way to do that is go to file, always go to save as, so you don't overwrite your original and come up with your own system. You could do final, you could type after, whatever system you want. And again, this is for web. So leave the sRGB profile check, click save. Now notice what happened. Because I made an alteration, it converted it from a background layer to just a layer. And notice what it by default did. It converted my format to .psd and I don't want that. Essentially, I want this to save as a JPEG. So to make it save as a JPEG, go back to file, save as, you leave everything else the same, but uh, you want to drop down in this format area and choose JPEG. So let me interject. Photoshop has updated its save feature and how you can access saving as a JPEG. So I wanted to cover that real quick. So typically, like I've already saved this layered PSD file, but let's say I wanted to output this single file as a JPEG and I go up to file. Well, see, I don't even get the chance to save it. I can only save as. So when I click save as, look at my options. In this video, I tell you to toggle on this format and it only gives me three options right here, which, you know, this is for giant files. I think it's over two gigabytes, Photoshop PDF and a TIFF. So the only way to even access, oh, and obviously save to cloud, but the only way to even access saving it as a JPEG is you have to choose save as copy. So you click save as copy. It opens up the same dialog box, except it says save as copy at the top. Now, when you go to the format, now you get the normal long list where you can select JPEG. Remember, if you're saving it for the web, you've always got to save it as sRGB or your colors will not look right in any of the social media platforms and any internet browser. So always shoot in the biggest color space as always, process in the biggest color space. But when you're outputting your images, make sure you embed the color profile of sRGB. But anyway, let me redo that because this is huge. When you go to file and you want to save 
an image and you come down, you won't see JPEG. You have to click save a copy and that will repopulate the same dialog box, but it titles it save a copy. And now when you go to format, you're able to click JPEG and watch what happens. When I click save, it's going to automatically save a copy of this, which means my PSD is still however it is, but this is going to give me a second new document in the location I decided as a JPEG. Generally, I always save at a maximum of 12. Remember, if you take it to a quality of 10, our eyeballs won't see the difference, but at a roughly, I can't even remember now, uh, take your file size down by like half. So click OK, and that way it's just saved all this as a copy. Because remember, you can't have layers in a JPEG. That's why it's a copy, because it's basically flattening your image. It says it can only be saved with a copy. That's because JPEGs can't ha handle layers. Just click Save. Okay. 